Uh, let's get started. So welcome to the very final lecture of the class. I hope you're all surviving the last week and um, uh, wrapping up your projects. So today we're going to be hearing about the future of NLP and deep learning. Uh, so Chris is still traveling and today we're going to be having Kevin Clark, who's one of the PhD students in the lab, uh, in the NLP lab. And he was also one of the head TAs for the class last year. So he's very familiar with the class as a whole. Um, so take it away, Kevin. Okay. Thanks, Abby. Um, yeah, it's great to be back after being TA last year. Um, I'm really excited today to be talking about the future of deep learning and NLP. Um, obviously, trying to forecast the future um, for deep learning or anything in that space is really difficult because the field is changing super quickly. Um, so as one what reference point, um, let's look at what did deep learning for NLP um, look like about five years ago? And really, a lot of ideas that are now considered to be pretty core techniques um, when we think of deep learning and NLP um, didn't even exist back then. Um, so things you learned in this class, like seek-to-seek, -seek, attention mechanism, um, large-scale reading comprehension, uh, even frameworks such as TensorFlow or PyTorch um, didn't exist. And uh, the point I want to make with this is that um, because of this, it's really difficult to, to look in, into the future and say, okay, what are things going to be like? Um, what I think we can do, though, is look at um, areas that right now are really sort of taking off. Um, so areas in which um, there's a lot, been a lot of recent success and kind of uh, project from that that those same areas will likely be important in the future. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to be mostly focusing on one key idea, uh, key idea, which is the idea of leveraging unlabeled examples when training our NLP systems. So I'll be talking a bit about doing that for machine translation, um, both in improving the quality of translation and even in doing uh, translation in a unsupervised way. So that means you don't have um, paired sentences uh, with, with their translations. Um, you try to learn a translation model only from monolingual corpus. Um, the second thing I'll be talking a little bit about is uh, OpenAI's GPT-2, um, and in general, this phenomenon of really scaling up um, deep learning models. Um, I know you saw a little bit of this in the lecture on contextual representation, but, but this will be a little bit more in depth. Um, and I think um, these new developments in NLP have had some um, pretty big uh, impacts in terms of uh, more broadly kind of beyond even the technology we're using. And in particular, um, it's starting to raise more and more concerns about the social impact of NLP, um, both um, in what our models can do and also in kind of plans of what, where people are looking to apply these models. Um, and I think that really has some risks associated with it um, in terms of security, also in terms of areas like bias. Um, I'm also going to talk a bit about future areas of research. Um, these are mostly research areas now that are, um, over the past year, have really kind of developed into promising areas, and I expect they will continue to be important in the future. Okay, um, start with, I want to ask this question, why has deep learning been so successful recently? Um, I, I like this comic. Um, here there's a statistical learning person, um, and they've got some really complicated, um, well-motivated uh, method for doing um, the task they care about, and then the neural net person just says, uh, stack more layers. Um, so, so the point I want to make here is that um, deep learning has not been successful recently because it's more theoretically motivated or it's more sophisticated than previous techniques. Um, in fact, I would say that actually a lot of um, older statistical methods have more of a, a theoretical underpinning than some of the tricks we do in deep learning. Um, really, the thing that makes deep learning so successful in recent years has been its ability to scale, right? So um, neural nets, a, as we increase the size of the data, as we increase the size of the models, um, they get really big boosts in accuracy in a way uh, other approaches do not. And um, if you look to the 80s and 90s, um, there was actually plenty of research in neural nets going on, um, but it hadn't, doesn't have the hype around it that it does now, and that seems likely to be because um, in the past there wasn't um, the same resources in terms of computers, in terms of data, and um, only now after we've reached sort of an inflection point where we can really take advantage of scale in our deep learning models, have we start to see it become um, a really successful paradigm for machine learning. Um, if we look at 
big uh, deep learning success stories, um, I think uh, you can see kind of this idea play out, right? So here are three of what are arguably the most famous uh, successes of deep learning, right? So there's image recognition, where before people used very highly engineered um, features to classify images, and now neural nets are much superior um, to those methods. Um, machine translation has really closed the gap between um, phrase-based uh, systems and human quality translation. So this is widely used in things like Google Translate. Um, the quality has actually gotten a lot better over the past five years. Um, another example that had a lot of hype around it is game playing. So um, there's been work on Atari games. There's been AlphaGo. Um, more recently, there's been uh, AlphaStar and OpenAI 5. Um, if you look at all three of these cases, underlying these successes is really large amounts of data, right? So for ImageNet, um, for image recognition, um, there is the ImageNet data set, which is 14 million images. Uh, machine translation data sets often have millions of examples. Um, for game playing, you can actually generate as much training data as you want, essentially, um, just by running your agent um, within the game um, over and over again. Um, so if we, if we look to NLP, um, the story is quite a bit different for a lot of tasks, um, right? So if you look at even pretty core kind of popular tasks, so say uh, reading comprehension in English, um, data sets like Squad are in the order of mm, like 100,000 examples, which is considerably less than the millions or tens of millions of examples um, that uh, these previous um, successes have, have benefited from. Um, and, and that's, of course, only for English, right? Um, there are um, thousands of other languages, and this is, I think, a, a problem with NLP data as it exists today. Um, the vast majority of data is in English, um, when in reality, fewer than 10% of the world's population um, speak English as their first language. Um, so these problems with small data sets are only compounded if you look at um, the full spectrum of languages um, that exist. Um, so, so what do we do uh, when we're limited by this data, but we want to take advantage of deep learning scale and, and train the biggest models we can? Um, the, the popular solution um, that's especially had recent success is using unlabeled data, um, because unlike labeled data, unlabeled data is very easy to acquire for language. Um, you can just go to the internet, you can go to books, you can get lots of text. Um, whereas labeled data usually requires, um, at the least, crowdsourcing examples, um, in some cases, you even require someone who's an expert in something like linguistics um, to, to annotate that data. Okay, so um, this first part of the talk is going to be applying this idea of leveraging unlabeled data to improve our NLP models um, to the task of machine translation. Um, so let's talk about machine translation data. Um, it is true that there do exist quite large data sets for machine translation. Um, those data sets don't exist because NLP researchers have annotated text for the purpose of training their models, right? They exist because uh, in various settings, translation is done just because it's useful. So for example, proceedings of the European Parliament, um, proceedings of the United Nations. Um, some uh, news sites, they translate their articles into many languages. Um, so really, the machine translation data we use to train our models are often more of byproducts of existing cases where translation is wanted, rather than um, kind of a, a full sampling of the sort of text we see in the world. Um, so that means number one is quite limited in domain, right? So it's not easy to find translated tweets um, unless you happen to work for Twitter. Um, in addition to that, um, it, there's limitations in terms of the languages that are covered, right? So some languages, say European languages, there's a lot of translation data. Um, for other languages, there's much less. Um, so in these settings where we want to work on a different domain or we want to work with a low resource language, um, we're limited by labeled data. Um, but what we can do is pretty easily find unlabeled data. Um, so it's actually a pretty solved problem, um, maybe not 100%, but we can, with good accuracy, look at some text and decide what language it's in, um, train a classifier to do that. Um, so this means it's really easy to find data in any language you care about, because you can just go on the web and essentially search for data in that language and acquire a large corpus of monolingual data. Okay, um, I'm now going into the first uh, approach um, 
I'm going to talk about on using unlabeled data to improve machine translation models. Um, this technique is called pre-training, and it's really rem reminiscent of ideas like um, ELMO. Um, the idea is to pre-train by doing language modeling. So if we have um, two languages we're interested in translating um, from one into the other, we'll collect large data sets for both of those languages, and then we can train uh, two language models, one each, um, on that data. And then um, we can use those uh, pre-trained language models as initialization for a machine translation system. Um, so the encoder will get initialized with the weights of the language model trained on the source side language. Um, the decoder will get initialized with weights trained on the target size language. Uh, and this will um, improve the performance of your model because during this pre-training, um, we hope that our language models will be learning useful information, such as you know, the meaning of words or um, uh, the kind of structure of the language um, they're processing. Um, and this can, uh, down the line, help the machine translation model um, when we fine tune it. Um, let me pause here and ask if there are any questions. And just in general, feel, feel free to ask questions throughout this talk. OK. Um, so, so here is a plot showing some results of this pre-training technique. Um, so this is English to German translation. Uh, the x-axis is how much training data, as in supervised training data, um, you provide these models. But of course, they also have large amounts of monolingual data for this pre-training step. Um, and you can see that this works pretty well, right? So you get about two blue points um, increase in performance. So that's this red line above the blue line um, when doing this pre-training technique. And uh, not too surprisingly, this gain is especially large when the amount of labeled data is small. Um, there is a problem with uh, pre-training, which I want to address, which is that uh, in pre-training, you have these two separate language models, and there's never really any interaction between the two um, when you're running them on the unlabeled corpus. Um, so here's a simple technique um, that uh, tries to solve this problem. Um, it's called self-training. Um, the idea is, given a sentence from our monolingual corpus, so in this case, I travel to Belgium, it's an English sentence, um, we won't have a human-provided translation for this sentence, um, but what we can do is we can run our machine translation model, and we'll get a translation in the target language. Um, since this is from a machine learning model, it won't be perfect, um, but we can hope that maybe our model can still learn from this kind of noisy labeled example, um, right? So we, we treat um, our original monolingual sentence and its machine-provided translation as though it were a human-provided translation and uh, train our machine learning model as normal on this example. Um, I think this seems pretty strange, actually, as, as a method when you first see it, because it seems really circular, right? So if you look at this, um, the uh, translation that the model is being trained to produce is actually exactly what it already produces to begin with, right? Because um, this translation came from our model in the first place. Um, so actually, in practice, this is not a technique that's very widely used due to this problem, um, but it motivates another technique um, called back translation. And this technique is really a very popular um, solution to that problem. And it's a method um, that has had a lot of success in using unlabeled data for translation. Um, so here's the approach. Um, rather than only having um, our translation system that goes from source language to target language, um, we're also going to train a model that goes from our target language to our source language. Um, so in this case, um, if, if at the end of the day we want a French to English model, um, we're going to start by actually training an English to French model. And then we can do something that's a lot like self-labeling. So we, we take an English sentence, um, we run our English to French model and translate it, um, the difference to uh, what we did before is that we're actually going to switch the source and target side. Um, so now in this case, the French sentence is the source sequence. Um, the target sequence is um, our original uh, English sentence um, that came from our monolingual corpora. And now we're training the, language, uh, the machine translation system that goes the other direction, so that goes French to English. Um, so, so why do we think this will work better? 
Um, number one, um, there's no longer this kind of circularity to the training because what the model is being trained on is the output of a completely different model. Um, another thing that I think is pretty crucial here is that um, the translations the, the model is uh, trained to produce, so the things that the decoder is actually learning to generate, um, are never bad translations, right? So if you look um, at this example, um, the, the target sequence for our French to English model, I travel to Belgium, um, that originally came from our monolingual corpus. <laughs> Um, so I think intuitively this makes sense, is that if we want to train a good translation model, um, it's probably okay to expose it to noisy inputs. So we expose it to the output of a system that's English to French, it might not be perfect. Um, but what we don't want to do is um, expose it to poor target sequences, because then it won't learn how to generate in that language effectively. Um, any questions on back translation before I get to results? Um, sure. Um, so this is assuming we have a large corpus of unlabeled data, and we want to be using it to help our translation model. Does that, does that make sense? Um, maybe you could clarify the question? So does it mean that I don't know the correct translation for I to Yeah, that's right. So we have a big corpus of English which includes the sentence, I traveled to Belgium, and we don't know the translations, but we'd still like to use this data. Um, yeah, another question? To avoid the translation ended up collapsing some bad you know, translation in the end. Yeah, so that's a good question, is how do you avoid um, both the models, let's say, sort of blowing up and producing garbage, and then they're just feeding garbage to each other? Um, the answer is that there is some amount of labeled data here as well. So on la unlabeled data, you do this, but on labeled data, you do standard training, and that way um, you avoid, you, you make sure, you kind of keep the models on track because they still have to fit to the labeled data. Um, yeah, another question? How do you schedule the training of the two models? Um, yeah, that is a good question, and I think that's basically almost like a hyperparameter you can tweak. Um, so um, I think a pretty common thing to do is first train two models only on labeled data, uh, then label, um, so then do back translation over a large corpus and um, kind of repeat that process over and over again. So each iteration, you train on the label data, label some unlabeled data, and now you have more data to work with. Um, but I think there'd be many kinds of scheduling that would be effective here. Um, okay, another question. Considering if you have a very good French to English model, you could try to look up or to test if it's a good French to English model, you could try to look up the original source and see if it matches. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Are you suggesting going like English to French to English and seeing if, I see, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting idea. And um, we're actually gonna talk a little bit about this sort of, it's called cycle consistency, this idea um, later in this talk. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to uh, the results. So, so here's the method for using unlabeled data to improve translation. Um, how well does it do? Um, the answer is that the improvements are, are um, at least to me, they were uh, surprisingly extremely good, right? So um, this is for English to German translation. Um, this is from some work by Facebook. So they use five million labeled sentence pairs, um, but they also use um, 230 uh, monolingual sentences, so sentences without translations. Um, and, and you can see that um, Compared to previous state of the art, they get uh, six blue points improvement, which um, if you compare it to most previous research on machine, tra machine translation is a really big gain, right? So even something like the invention of the transformer, which most people would consider to be a really significant uh, research development in NLP, um, that improved over prior work by about two and a half blue points. Um, and here, without doing any sort of fancy uh, model design, just by using way more data, um, we get actually much larger improvements. Um, okay, so an interesting question to think about um, is suppose we only have our monolingual corpora. So we don't have any sentences that have been human translated, we just have sentences in two languages. Um, so the scenario you can sort of imagine is suppose um, an alien comes down and um, starts talking to you in its uh, weird alien language. 
um, and it talks a lot, um, would you eventually be able to translate what it's saying to English um, just by having a really large amount of data? Um, so I'm going to start with um, a simpler task than full-on translating when you only have unlabeled sentences. Um, instead of doing sentence-to-sentence -sentence translation, let's start by only worrying about word-to-word -word translation. Um, so the goal here is, given a word in one language, find its translation, um, but without using any labeled data. Um, and and the, method, the method we're going to use to try to solve this task is called uh, cross-lingual embeddings. Um, so the goal is to learn uh, word vectors for words in both languages, and we'd like those word vectors to have all the nice properties you've already learned about word vectors having, um, but we also want word vectors for a particular language um, to be close to the word vector of its translation. Um, so I'm not sure if it's visible in this figure, but this figure shows a, a large number of English and I think German words, and you can see that um, uh, the, each English word has its corresponding German word um, nearby to it in its embedding space. So if we learn embeddings like this, then it's pretty easy to do word-to-word -word translation. Um, we just pick an English word, we find the nearest uh, German word in this joint embedding space, and that will give us a translation for the English word. Um, our key method for, or the key assumption that we're going to be using to solve this is that um, the, even though um, if you run word to vec twice, you'll get really different embeddings, um, the structure of that embedding space has a lot of regularity to it, and we can take advantage of that regularity um, to help find when um, an, an alignment between those embedding spaces. Um, so to be kind of more concrete here, here is a picture of two sets of word embeddings. So in red, we have um, English words. In uh, blue, we have Italian words. And although um, the vector spaces right now look very different to each other, um, the, you can see that they have a really similar structure, right? So you'd imagine distances are kind of similar, that the distance from uh, cat and feline in the um, English embedding space should be pretty similar to the distance between uh, gatto and uh, felino in the um, Italian space. Um, and this kind of motivates an algorithm for learning these cross-lingual embeddings. Um, so, so here's the idea. What we're going to try to do is learn what's essentially a rotation such that we can transform um, our set of English embeddings so that they match up with our Italian embed embeddings. Um, so mathematically what this means is we're going to learn a matrix W such that if we take, let's say, uh, the, the word vector for cat in English and we multiply it by W, um, we end up with the uh, vector for uh, gato in Spanish or Italian. Um, uh, and a detail here is that um, we're going to constrain W to be orthogonal. Um, and what that means geometrically is just that W is only going to be uh, doing a rotation to the uh, vectors um, in X. Um, it's not going to be doing some other uh, weirder transformation. Um, so, so this is our goal, is to learn this W. Um, next I'm going to be talk about, talking about how actually do we learn this W. Um, and there's actually a bunch of techniques for learning this W matrix. Um, but um, here is one of them that I think is quite clever. It's called adversarial training. Um, so it works as follows. Is in addition to trying to learn this W matrix, we're also going to be trying to learn a model that uh, is called a discriminator. And what it'll do is take a vector and it'll try to predict is that vector originally um, an English word embedding or is it originally an Italian word embedding? Um, in other words, if you think about uh, the diagram, what we're asking our discriminator to do is uh, it's given one of these points and it's trying to predict is it basically a red point, so an English word originally, or is it a blue point? Um, so if we have no W matrix, then this is a really easy task for the discriminator because um, the uh, word embeddings for uh, English and Italian are clearly separated. Um, however, if we learn a W matrix that succeeds in aligning all these embeddings on top of each other, 
then um, our discriminator will never do a good job, right? We can, we can imagine it'll never really do better than 50%, um, because given a vector for, say, cat, it won't know, is that the vector for cat that's been transformed by W, or is it actually the vector for gato? Um, because in this case, those two vectors are aligned, so they're on top of each other. Um, so um, during training, you first um, you alternate between training the discriminator a little bit, which means uh, making sure it's as good as possible at distinguishing the English from Italian words, and then you train uh, the W, and the goal for training W is to uh, essentially confuse the discriminator as much as possible. Um, so you want to have a situation where um, you can't, uh, with this machine learning model, figure out if a word embedding actually um, was um, originally from English or if it's an Italian word vector. Um, and so at the end of the day, you have, you have vectors that are kind of aligned with each other. Um, any questions about this approach? Okay. Um, here, there's a link to a paper with more details. There's actually kind of a range of other tricks you can do, um, but this is kind of a key idea. Um, okay, so that was doing word-to-word -word unsupervised translation. Um, how do we do full sentence-to-sentence -sentence translation? Um, so we're going to use um, a standard sort of seek-to-seek -seek model um, without even an attention mechanism. Um, there's one change to the standard seek-to-seek -seek model going on here, which is that um, we're going to use the same encoder and decoder um, regardless of the input and output languages. So you can see um, in this example, um, we could give the encoder an English sentence, we could also give it a French sentence, and it'll have um, these cross-lingual embeddings, so it'll have vector representations for English words and French words, which means it can handle sort of any input. Um, for the decoder, we need to give it some information about what language is it supposed to generate in, is it going to generate in French or English? Um, so the way that is done is by uh, feeding in a special token, which here is uh, fr in bra brackets to represent French, that tells the model, okay, you should generate in French now. Um, here in this figure, it's only French, but you could imagine also feeding this model uh, English in brackets, and then that'll tell it to uh, generate in English. And one thing you can see is that you could use this sort of model to generate, to go from English to French, um, you could also use this model as an autoencoder, right? So uh, at the bottom, um, it's taking in a French sentence as input, and it's just generating French as output, um, which here means just reproducing the original uh, input sequence. Um, so just a small change to standard seek-to-seek. -seek. Um, here's how we're going to train the seek-to-seek -seek model. Um, there's going to be two training objectives. Um, and I'll, I'll explain sort of why they're uh, present in this model um, in just a few slides. Um, for now, let's just say what they are. Um, so the first one is um, called a denoising autoencoder. Um, what we're going to train our model to do in this case is take a uh, sentence. So um, and here it's going to be an English sentence, but it could also be a French sentence. Um, we're going to scramble up the words a little bit. And then we're going to ask the model to uh, denoise that sentence which in other words means regenerating what the sentence actually was before it was scrambled. And um, maybe one idea of why this would be a useful training objective is that uh, since we have an encoder decoder without deten attention, um, th the encoder is converting the entirety of the source sentence into a single vector. Um, what an autoencoder does is ensure that that vector contains all the information about the sentence such that we are able to uh, recover what the original sentence was um, from the vector produced by the encoder. Um, so that was objective one. Um, training objective two is now we're actually going to be trying to do translation, um, but um, as before, we're going to be using this back translation idea. So remember, we only have unlabeled sentences, we don't have any human provided translations, um, but what we can still do is given a, um, let's say an English sentence, or let's say a French sentence, given a French sentence, we can translate it to English um, using our model in its current state. Uh, and then we can ask that model to translate from English, or translate that, yeah, translate that English back into French. Um, so what you can imagine is in this setting, um, the input sequence is going to be somewhat messed up 
because it's the output of our imperfect machine learning model. So here the input sequence is just I am student. Um, a word has been dropped, but um, we're now going to train it to even with this kind of bad input to reproduce the original um, French sentence um, from our uh, corpus of, of monolingual um, French text. Um, let, me, let me pause here actually and ask for questions. Sure. Just a quick thing. When you, what if um, the reason you have this orthogonality constraint for your word to work embedding, is it to avoid overfitting? Have you tried yeah. to take that off and you know, to see what the device would be results? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so this is going back to earlier when there was a word word translation. Why would we constrain that W matrix to be orthogonal? Um, essentially, that's right. It's to avoid overfitting, and in particular, it's making this assumption that our embedding spaces are so similar that there's actually just a rotation that distinguishes um, our word vectors in English versus our word vectors in Italian. Um, I think there has been um, there have been results that don't include that orthogonality constraint, and I think it slightly hurts performance to not have that in there. Okay. Um, so, so continuing with um, unsupervised machine translation, um, I, I gave a training method. I didn't quite explain why it would work. So, so um, here is some more intuition for, for this idea. Um, so remember, um, we're going to initialize our machine translation model with these cross-lingual embeddings, which mean the English and French word should look close to identically. Um, we're also using the shared um, encoder. Um, so that means if you think about it, um, at the top we have just a autoencoding objective, and we can certainly believe that our model can learn this. Um, it, it's a pretty simple task. Um, now imagine we're giving our model a French sentence as input instead. Um, since the uh, embeddings are going to look pretty similar, and since the encoder is the same, um, it's pretty likely that the model's representation of this French sentence should actually be very similar to the representation of the English sentence. Um, so when this representation is passed into the decoder, um, we can hope that we'll get the same output as before. Um, um, so here's like sort of as a starting point, we, we can hope that our model um, already is able to have some translation capability. Um, another way of thinking about this is that what we really want our model to do is to be able to encode a sentence such that that representation um, is sort of a universal kind of interlingua, so a universal, um, uh, universal representation of that sentence that doesn't uh, that's not specific to the language. And so, so here's kind of a picture that's trying to get at this. So our autoencoder um, and, um, and our back translation example, um, here the target sequence is the same. Um, so what that essentially means is that the vectors for the English sentence and the French sentence um, are going to be trained to be the same, um, right? Because if they were different, our uh, decoder would be generating different uh, outputs on these two examples. Um, so he, this is just another sort of intuition, is that um, what our model is trying to learn here is kind of a way of encoding the information of a sentence in a vector, um, but in a way that is language agnostic. Um, any more questions about uh, unsupervised machine translation? OK. Um, so going on to results of this approach, um, here, the horizontal lines are um, the results of an unsupervised machine translation model. Um, the lines that go up are for a supervised machine translation model um, as we give it more and more data. Right? So unsurprisingly, um, given a large amount of supervised data, um, the supervised machine translation models work much better than the unsupervised machine translation model. Um, but um, the unsupervised machine translation model actually still does quite well. Um, so if you see it around uh, 10,000 to 100,000 training examples, um, it actually does just as well or better than supervised translation. And I think that's a really promising result, um, because if you think of um, 
low resource settings where there isn't much labeled examples, um, that suddenly becomes really nice that you can perform this well um, without even needing to use a training set. Um, another thing kind of fun you can do with a unsupervised machine translation model is attribute transfer. Um, so basically, you can um, take uh, collections of text that uh, split by any attribute you want. So for example, you could go on Twitter, look at hashtags to decide which tweets are annoyed and which tweets are relaxed. And then you can treat those two corpora as text as though they were two different languages. And you can train an unsupervised machine translation model uh, to convert from one to the other. Um, and you can see these examples. Um, the model actually does a pretty good job of sort of minimally changing the sentence, kind of preserving a lot of that sentence's original semantics, um, such that the target attribute is changed. Um, I also want to throw a little bit of cold water on this idea. So I do think it's really exciting and, and almost kind of mind-blowing that you can do this translation without labeled data. Um, Certainly, right, it's really hard to imagine someone giving me a bunch of books in Italian and say, okay, learn Italian um, without, you know, teaching you how to specifically do the translation. Um, but um, even though these methods so promise, um, mostly they have shown promise on languages that are quite closely related. So those previous results, those were all um, some combination of English to French or English to German um, or so on, and those languages are quite similar. Um, so if you look at um, a different language pair, let's say English to Turkish, where um, the linguistics in those two languages are quite different, um, these methods do still work to some extent. Um, so they get around five blue points, let's say, um, but they don't work nearly as well um, as they do in the, uh, in the other settings, right? So there's still a huge gap to purely supervised learning. Um, right, so we're probably not, you know, quite at this stage where an alien could come down and it's sort of no problem, let's use our unsupervised machine translation system, um, but I, I still think it's pretty exciting progress. Um, yeah, question? Um, so what you're saying is that the genealogy of the language might lead it to superimpose worse, right? Because my original thought was that if you took, for example, like Latin, which doesn't have a word for, you know, like the modern concept of a car, I thought that would do more poorly. Uh, but if, but uh, basically what I'm asking is, do you think English maps better to Latin because they're both related and worse to Turkish, or is it the other way around? Um, I would expect English to map quite a lot better to Latin, and I think part of the issue here is that um, the difficulty in translation, I think, is not really at the word level. So, I mean, that certainly is an issue that words exist in one language that don't exist in another. Um, but I think actually more substantial differences between language is at the level of like syntax um, um, or, you know, semantics, right? How ideas are expressed. Um, so, so I think uh, I would expect Itali uh, Latin to have, you know, relatively similar syntax to English. Um, compared to, say, Turkish. And I imagine that is probably the bigger obstacle for unsupervised machine translation models. Um, I'm going to really quickly go into this last recent research paper, which is basically taking BERT, um, which, which you've learned about. Um, correct? Yes? OK. And uh, making it cross-lingual. Um, so um, here's what regular BERT is, right? We have a, a sequence of sentences in English. We're going to mask out some of the words. And we're going to ask BERT, which is our uh, transformer model, um, to essentially fill in the blanks and predict what were the words that were dropped out. Um, uh, what actually has already been done by Google is training a multilingual BERT. Um, so what they did essentially is concatenate um, a whole bunch of corpora in different languages and then train one model um, doing, using this masked LM objective um, on all of that text at once. And that's a publicly released model. Um, the, the new kind of extension to this that has recently been uh, proposed by Facebook is to actually combine this masked LM training objective um, with uh, translation. So what they do is sometimes give this model, um, a, in this case, a sequence in English, and a sequence in uh, French, um, drop out some of the words, and just as before, ask the model to fill it in. And the motivation here is that um, this will much better 
cause the model to understand the relation between these two languages, because if you're trying to find a, fill in a English word that's been dropped, um, the best way to do it, if you have a translation, is look at the French side and try to find that word. Um, hopefully that one hasn't been dropped as well, and then you can um, much more easily fill in the blank. And um, this actually leads to very uh, substantial improvements in unsupervised machine translation. So just like uh, BERT is used for other tasks in NLP, they basically take this cross-lingual BERT, they use it as initialization for a unsupervised machine translation system, and they get you know, really large gains on the order of 10 blue points, um, such that the gap between unsupervised machine translation and the current supervised state of the art um, is much smaller. Um, so um, this is a pretty recent idea, but I think it also shows promise in um, really improving the quality of translation um, through using unlabeled data. Um, although I guess, yeah, I guess in this case of BERT, they are using label translation data as well. Uh, any, any questions about this? Okay. Um, so that is all I'm going to say about using unlabeled data for translation. Um, the next part of this talk is about um, what happens if we really scale up these unsupervised uh, language models. Um, so in particular, I'm gonna talk about GPT-2, which is a new model uh, by OpenAI that's essentially a really giant language model, um, and I think it has some interesting uh, implications. Um, so first of all, um, here's just the sizes of a bunch of different uh, uh, NLP models. And um, you know, maybe a couple years ago, the, the standard sort of LSTM uh, medium-sized model was on the order of about 10 million parameters, where, 10 pr uh, where a parameter is just you know, a single weight, let's say, in the neural net. Um, Elmo and uh, GPT, so the original OpenAI paper before they did this GPT-2, and we're about 10 times bigger than that. Um, GPT-2 is about another order of magnitude bigger. Um, one kind of interesting comparison point here is that uh, GPT-2, which is 1.5 billion parameters, actually has more parameters than um, a honeybee brain has synapses. Um, so that sounds kind of impressive, right? You know, honeybees are not the smartest of animals, but they can still fly around and find nectar or whatever. Um, but, you know, of course, this isn't really an apples to apples comparison, right? So a synapse and a weight in a neural net are really quite different. Um, but I just think it's one kind of interesting milestone, let's say, in terms of model size um, that has been surpassed. Um, one thing to point out here is that um, this increasing scaling of deep learning is really a general trend uh, in all of machine learning, so beyond NLP. Um, so this plot is showing uh, time um, on the x-axis and the y-axis is log scaled um, the amount of petaflops used to train this model. Um, so what this means is that uh, the trend, at least currently, is that there's exponential growth in how much compute power um, we're throwing at our machine learning models. Um, I guess it is kind of unclear, you know, will exponential growth continue, but certainly um, there's rapid growth in the size of our models. And it's leading to some really amazing results, right? So here are results not from language, but for vision. Um, this is uh, a generative adversarial network that's been trained um, on a lot of data, and it's been trained at really large scale, so it's a big model, um, kind of in between the size of Elmo and Bert, let's say. And um, these photos here are actually uh, productions of the model. So those aren't real photos, those are things the model has just kind of hallucinated out of thin air, and um, at least to me, they look essentially photorealistic. Um, there's also a website that um, is, is fun to look at if you're, not, if you're interested, which is uh, thispersondoesnotexist.com. Um, so if you go there, you'll see a very convincing photo of a person, um, but it's not a real photo, it's again like a hallucinated image produced by a GAN. Um, we're also seeing really huge models being used for image recognition. Um, so this is recent work by Google where they trained an ImageNet model with uh, half a billion parameters. Um, so that's bigger than BERT, uh, but not as big as GPT-2. Um, this plot here is showing uh, log-scaled number of parameters on the x-axis and then accuracy at ImageNet on the y-axis. And sort of unsurprisingly, uh, bigger models perform better. And there seems to actually be a pretty consistent trend here, which is um, accuracy is increasing with the log of the, the model size. 
Um, I want to go into a little bit more detail. Um, how is it possible that we can scale up models and train models at such a large extent? Um, one answer is just better hardware, and in particular, um, there's a growing uh, number of companies that are developing hardware specifically for deep learning. Um, so these are even more kind of constrained in the kind of operations they can do than a GPU, um, but they do those operations even faster. Um, so uh, Google's tensor processing units is one example. Um, there are actually a bunch of other companies working on this idea. Um, the other way to scale up models is by taking advantage of parallelism. And there's two kinds of parallelism um, that I want to talk about very briefly. So one is data parallelism. Um, in this case, um, each of your, uh, let's say, GPUs will have a copy of the model. And what you essentially do is split the mini batch that you're training on across these different models. So if you have, let's say, 16 GPUs and each of them see a batch size of 32, um, you can aggregate the gradients of these 16, uh, uh, if you do uh, backprop on these 16 uh, GPUs, and you end up with effectively a batch size of 512. Um, so this allows you to train models much faster. Um, the other kind of parallelism that's growing in importance is model par parallelism. Um, so um, eventually, models get so big that they can't even fit on a single GPU, and they can't even do a batch size of one. Um, in this case, you actually need to split up the model across multiple, uh, compu uh, multiple compute units. Um, and um, that's what's done for models kind of the size of, of let's say, uh, GPT-2. Um, there are new frameworks such as mesh TensorFlow, um, which are basically designed to make this sort of model parallelism easier. Um, okay, so on to GPT-2. Um, I know you already saw this a little bit in the contextualized uh, um, embeddings um, lecture, um, but I'm going to go into some more depth here. Um, so, so essentially, it's a really large transformer language model. Um, so there's nothing really kind of novel here in terms of new training algorithms or in terms of um, the loss function or anything like that. Um, the thing that makes it different from prior work is that it's just really, really big. Um, it's trained on a correspondingly huge amount of text, so it's trained on 40 gigabytes, and that's roughly 10 times larger than previous uh, language models have been trained on. Um, when you have that size of data set, um, the only way to get that much text is essentially to go to the web. Um, so one thing OpenAI put quite a bit of effort into when they're developing this network was to ensure that that text was pretty high quality. Um, and they did that in a kind of interesting way. They, they looked at Reddit, which is this website where people uh, can vote on links. And then they said, um, if a link has a lot of votes, then it's probably sort of a decent link. There's probably um, you know, reasonable text there for a model to learn. Um, OK, so if we have this super huge language model like GPT-2, um, there's a question of uh, what can you actually do with it? Um, well, obviously, if you have a language model, you can do language modeling with it. Um, but one thing kind of interestingly, uh, interesting is that you can run this language model on uh, existing benchmarks um, for, for language modeling. Um, and it gets state-of-the-art perplexity on these benchmarks, even though it never sees the training data for these benchmarks. Right? So normally, if you want to, say, evaluate your, a language model on the Penn Tree Bank, you first train on the Penn Tree Bank, and then you evaluate on this held out set. Um, in this case, um, uh, GPT-2, just by virtue of having seen so much text and being such a large model, um, outperforms all these other uh, prior works, even though it's not seeing that data um, on, on a bunch of different uh, language modeling benchmarks. Um, but there's a bunch of other interesting experiments that OpenAI ran with this language modeling, and these were based on zero-shot learning. So zero-shot learning just means trying to do a task without ever training on it. And um, the way you can do this with a language model is by designing a prompt you feed into the language model and then have it just generate from there, and hopefully it generates something relevant to the task you're trying to solve. So for example, for reading comprehension, what you can do is take the context paragraph, uh, concatenate the question to it, and then add uh, a colon, which is a way, I guess, of telling the model, OK, you should be producing an answer to this question, and then just have it generate text 
um, and perhaps it'll generate something that is actually answering um, the question and is, is paying attention to the context. Um, and similarly, for summarization, you can do the article, then TLDR, and perhaps the model will produce a summary. Um, you can even do translation, where you give the model um, some ex a list of known English to French translations. So you sort of prime it um, to tell it that it should be doing translation. And then you give it the source sequence equals blank and have it just run. And um, perhaps it'll generate um, the sequence in the target language. Um, OK, so, so here are what the results look like. Um, for all of these, uh, the x-axis is, is log-scaled model size, um, and the y-axis is accuracy. Um, and the dotted lines basically correspond to um, existing works on these tasks. Um, so for most of these tasks, um, GPT-2 is quite a bit below um, existing systems. Um, but there's, of course, this big difference, right? Existing systems are trained specifically to do um, whatever task they're being evaluated on, where GPT-2 is um, only trained to do language modeling. And as it learns language modeling, it's sort of picking up on these other tasks. Um, so, right, so for example, um, it does uh, English to French machine translation um, not as well as uh, standard unsupervised machine translation, which is those uh, dotted lines. Um, but it still, it still does quite well. And um, one thing kind of interesting is the trend line, right? For almost all of these tasks, um, performance is getting uh, much better as the model increases in size. Um, I think a particularly interesting uh, one of these tasks is machine translation, right? So the question is, how can it be doing machine translation when all we're giving it is a bunch of web pages and those web pages are almost all in English? And yet somehow it sort of magically picks up um, a little bit of machine translation, right? So it's not a great model, but it can still um, you know, do a decent job in some cases. Um, and the answer is that if you look at this giant corpus of English, occasionally uh, within, within that corpus, you see examples of translations, right? So you see um, a, a French idiom in its translation or a quote from someone who's French and then the translation in English. And um, kind of amazingly, I think, this big model um, sees enough of these examples that it actually starts to learn how to generate French, um, even though that wasn't really sort of an intended part of its training. Um, another interesting um, thing to dig a bit more into is its ability to do question answering. Um, so uh, a simple baseline for question answering gets about 1% accuracy. GPT-2 barely does better at 4% accuracy. So this isn't like, you know, super amazing we solved question answering. Um, but um, it's still pretty interesting in that if you look at answers the model is most confident about, you can see that it sort of has learned some facts about the world, right? So it's learned that Charles Darwin wrote Origin of Species. Um, Normally, in the history of NLP, if you want to get kind of world knowledge into an NLP system, you'd need something like a big database of facts. And even though this is still kind of very early stages and that um, there's still a huge gap between 4% accuracy and the 70% um, you know, or so that uh, state-of-the-art open domain question answering systems can do, um, it, it, um, it still can uh, pick up some world knowledge just by reading a lot of text um, without kind of explicitly having that knowledge put into the model. Um, any questions, by the way, on GPT-2 so far? Okay. Um, so, so one question that's interesting to think about is what happens if our models get even bigger? Um, so here I've done the um, very scientific thing of drawing some lines in PowerPoint and seeing where they meet up. Um, and you can see that um, if the trend holds at about one trillion parameters, um, we get to human level reading comprehension performance. Um, so if that's true, it would be really astonishing. Um, I actually do expect that a one trillion parameter model would be attainable in, I don't know, 10 years or so. Um, but of course, right, the trend isn't clear. So, so if you look at summarization, for example, it seems like performance is already uh, uh, topped out. Um, so I think this will be a really interesting thing kind of going forward, um, looking at the future of NLP, um, is how this scaling will change um, the way NLP is approached. 
Um, the other interesting thing about GPT-2 was its reaction from um, the media and also from other researchers. Um, and the real cause of uh, a lot of the, the controversy about it was this statement from OpenAI. Um, they said that we're not going to release our full language model um, because it's too dangerous. You know, our language model is too good. Um, so uh, the media really enjoyed this and you know, said that uh, machine learning is going to break the internet. Um, there's also some pretty interesting reaction from uh, researchers, right? So um, there's some kind of tongue-in-cheek responses here, right? You know, I trained a model on MNIST. Is it too dangerous for me to release it? Um, and similarly, we've done really great work, but we can't release it. It's too dangerous. So you're just going to have to trust us on this. Um, looking at more kind of reasoned um, debate about this issue, um, you still see articles um, arguing both sides. So, so these are two arg articles um, from uh, The Gradient, which is a sort of machine learning newsletter. Um, and they're or arguing precisely opposite sides of this issue, um, should it be released or not. Um, so um, I guess I, I can briefly go over a few arguments for or against. Um, there's kind of a lot of debate about this, and I don't want to go too deep into a controversial issue. Um, but here's a long list of kind of things people have said about this, right? So um, here's why you should release. Um, you know, one complaint is that, is this model really that special? There's nothing new going on here. It's just 10 times bigger than previous models. Um, and there's also some ar ar arguments that um, even if this one isn't released, you know, in five years, everybody can train a model this good. Um, and actually, if you look at image recognition or uh, look at images and speech data, um, it already is possible to synthesize highly convincing um, fake images and fake speech. Um, so, so kind of what makes this thing different from those other, um, those other uh, uh, systems? And speaking of other systems, right, Photoshop has existed for a long time, so we can already convincingly fake images. Um, people have just learned to adjust and learn that you shouldn't always trust what's in an image um, because it may have been um, altered in some way. Um, on the other hand, you could say, OK, uh, Photoshop exists, but um, you can't sort of scale up Photoshop and, and start mass producing fake content the way you can with this sort of model. And they point to the danger of uh, fake news, um, fake reviews, um, in general, just astroturfing, which means basically uh, creating fake user content that's supporting a view you want other people to hold. Um, this is actually something that's already done um, pretty widely by companies and governments. So there's a lot of evidence for this. Um, but they're, of course, hiring people to write all these comments on news articles, let's say. And um, we don't want to make their job any easier by producing a, a machine that could potentially do this. Um, so um, I'm not really going to take a side here. Um, there's still a lot of debate about this. Um, I think you know, the, main, the main takeaway here is that as a community, um, people in machine learning and NLP don't really have a handle on this. Right? We're sort of caught by surprise by um, OpenAI's um, decision here. And um, uh, that means that you know, there really is some figuring out that needs to be done on what exactly is responsible to release publicly, um, what kind of research problems should we be working on, um, and so on. Um, so yeah, any questions about um, this, this reaction or this debate in general? OK. Um, I think something arising from this debate is um, the question of, um, should really the ML people be the people making these sort of decisions? Or is there a need for more interdisciplinary science where we look at um, experts in, say, computer security, um, people from social sciences, um, you know, people who are experts in ethics, um, to look at these decisions? Um, right? So GPT-2 is definitely one example of where suddenly it seems like um, our NLP technology has a lot of uh, pitfalls, right? Where they could be used in a malicious way or they could cause damage. And I think this trend is only going to increase. Um, if you look at kind of areas of NLP that people are working on, uh, increasingly people are working on really high stakes applications of NLP. Um, and those often have really big uh, ramifications, um, especially if you think from the angle of uh, bias and fairness. 
Um, so so let's, let's go over a couple examples of this. Um, um, one, so some, some areas where, where this is happening is people are looking at M uh, NLP to look at judicial decisions. So for example, should this person uh, get bail or not? Um, for hiring decisions, right? So you look at someone's resume, you run NLP on it, and then you make a decision automatically, um, sh should we throw out this resume or not? So do some sort of screening, um, grading tests. Um, if you take the GRE, um, your, your test will be graded by a machine. Um, a person will also look at it. Um, but nevertheless, um, that's you know a sometimes very impactful part of your life um, when it's when it's a test that um, in, you know affects your um, acceptance into a school, let's say. Um, so I think there is are some some good sides of using machine learning in these kinds of contexts. So one is that we can pretty quickly evaluate a machine learning system and search out does it have some kind of bias just by running it on a bunch of data and seeing what it does, and also, perhaps even more importantly, um, we can fix this kind of problem if it arises, right? So um, it's probably easier to fix a machine learning system that screens resumes than it is to, to fix having you know, 5,000 executives that are slightly sexist or something, right? So, so in, in this way, um, there is a sort of positive angle on using machine learning in these high stakes um, uh, decisions. Um, on the other hand, um, it's been pretty well uh, known, and I know you had a lecture on bias and fairness, that machine learning often reflects bias in a data set. Um, it can even amplify bias in the data set. Um, and there's concern of kind of a feedback loop where a biased algorithm actually will lead to the creation of more biased data, um, in which case these problems will only compound and get worse. Um, so for all of the uh, high impact decisions um, I, I listed on that slide, there are examples where things have gone awry, right? So Amazon had some AI that was um, working as a recruiting tool and it turned out to be sexist. Um, um, there's been some kind of early pilots of using AI um, in the justice system and those also have had, um, in some cases, really bad results. Um, if you look at automatic essay grading, um, it's not really a great you know, NLP system, right? So here's an example um, excerpt of an essay that um, a automatic grading system used by the GRE test gives uh, a very high score. Um, but really, it's just kind of a salad of uh, big fancy words. And that's enough to convince the model that this is a, a great essay. Um, um, the last um, area that I want to talk about where, where um, you can see there's really some risks and some pitfalls with using NLP technology is chatbots. Um, so I think chatbots do have a side where they can be very beneficial. Um, Wobot is one example. It's this company that has this chatbot you can talk to if you're not um, feeling too great, and it'll try to, um, I don't know, cheer you up. Um, so, so that you know, could be a, a really nice piece of technology that helps people. Um, but on the other hand, there's some big risks. So, so one example is Microsoft Research had a chatbot trained on tweets, and it started quickly saying racist things and had to be pulled. Um, so I think all of this highlights that um, as NLP is becoming more effective, people are seeing opportunities to use it in um, increasingly high stakes decisions. And although you know, there's some nice, there's some appeal to that, um, there's also a lot of risk. Um, any more questions on uh, this sort of social impact of NLP? Okay. Um, last part of this lecture is looking more at future research, right? And in particular, um, I think a lot of the current research trends are kind of reactions to BERT, um, right? So, that, so the question is, what did BERT solve and, and what do we work on next? Um, so here are results on the GLUE benchmark. Um, that is uh, a compendium of uh, 10 natural language understanding tasks. Um, and you t get an average score across those 10 tasks. Um, the left, uh, two, the two, or sorry, the, right, the two rightmost models are um, uh, non, uh, are just supervised trained machine learning systems, right? So we have bag of vectors. Um, we instead use our fancy neural net architecture of BIOSTM plus attention, and we get about five points. Um, but the gains from BERT uh, really dwarf that difference, right? So, so BERT improves results by about uh, 17 points, and we end up being actually quite close um, to human performance on these tasks. 
Um, so one sort of implication of this that people are wondering about is, is this kind of the death of architecture engineering? Um, so I'm sure all of you who have worked on the default final project um, have seen a whole bunch of fancy pictures showing different uh, uh, architectures for solving squad. Um, there are a lot of papers. They all propose some kind of uh, attention mechanism or something like that. Um, and um, right with BERT, it's sort of, um, you don't need to do any of that, right? You just train a transformer and you give it enough data and actually you're doing great on squad. You know, maybe um, these uh, architectural enhancements are not necessarily um, the key thing that'll drive progress in uh, improving results on these tasks. Um, right, so uh, if you look at this at the perspective of a researcher, you can think a researcher will say, okay, I could spend six months designing a fancy new architecture for squad, and if I do a good job, maybe I'll improve results by one uh, F1 point. Um, but in the case of BERT, um, increasing the size of their model 3x, which is the difference between they have like a base size model and a large model, um, that improved results by 5 F1 points. Um, so it does seem to suggest we need to sort of reprioritize um, which avenues of research we pursue because this architecture engineering isn't providing kind of gains for its time investment the way uh, leveraging unlabeled data is. Um, so now if you look at the squad leaderboard, um, I think at least the top 20 entrants are all BERT plus something. Um, one other issue uh, I think BERT has raised is that um, we need harder tasks, right? BERT has almost solved squad if you define it by uh, getting close to human performance. Um, so there's been um, a growth in new data sets that are um, more challenging. And there are a couple ways in which um, they can be more challenging. So one is um, doing reading comprehension on longer documents or doing it across more than one document. Um, one area is looking at uh, coming up with harder questions that require multi-hop reasoning. Um, so that essentially means you have to string together multiple supporting facts from different places um, to produce the correct answer. Um, and another area, situating question answering within a dialogue. Um, there's also been a kind of small detail with the construction of reading comprehension data sets that has actually really affected um, the, the difficulty of the task. And that is whether um, when you create these data sets, um, is the person who writes questions about a passage, can they see that passage or not? Um, so of course, it's much easier to come up with a question that when you see the passage, and if you come up with a question without seeing the passage, you may not even have a answerable question. Um, but the problem with looking at the passage is that first of all, it's not realistic, right? So uh, if I'm asking a question, you know, I'm not going to have usually the paragraph that answers that question sitting in front of me. Um, on top of that, it really encourages easy questions, right? So um, if you're a mechanical Turker and you're paid to write as many questions as possible, and then you see an article that says, um, I don't know, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States. Um, what are you going to write as your question? You're going to write, who was the 16th president of the United States? You're not going to write something more interesting that's harder to answer. Um, so, so this is one way in which crowdsource data sets have changed. Um, people are now making sure questions are sort of independent of, of the context. Um, so I'm going to briefly uh, go over a couple new data sets in this line. So one is called QUAC, which stands for Question Answering in Context. Um, in this data set, there is a teacher and a student. Um, the teacher sees a Wikipedia article. The student wants to learn about this Wikipedia article. And the goal is to train a machine learning model that asks as the teacher. Um, so you can imagine maybe in the future, this sort of technology would be useful for uh, um, education, for kind of having, uh, adding some automation. Um, uh, one thing that makes this task difficult is that uh, questions depend on the entire history of the conversation. Um, so for example, uh, if you look um, on the left here, uh, the example um, um, dialogue, uh, the third question is, was he the star? Um, clearly, you can't answer that question unless you look back earlier in the dialogue and realize that the subject of this uh, conversation is Daffy Duck. Um, and, and sort of because this data set is more challenging, you can see there's a, there's a much bigger gap to human performance, right? So if you train some BERT with some extensions, you're st the, uh, the results are still like 15 F1 points worse than human performance. Um, 
Um, here's uh, one other data set um, called Hot Pot QA. Um, it is uh, designed instead for multi-hop reasoning. Um, so essentially, in order to answer a question, you have to look at multiple documents. You have to look at different facts from those documents and perform some inference um, to get what the correct answer is. Um, so I think you know, this is a, a much harder task. And again, um, there's a much bigger gap between human performance. Um, any questions on uh, new data sets, um, harder ch tasks for NLP? OK. Um, I'm going to kind of rapid fire go through um, a couple more areas in the last minutes of this talk. Um, so multitask learning, I think, is really growing in importance. Um, of course, um, you've had a whole lecture on this, right? So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, but maybe one uh, point of interest is that if you look at performance on this glue benchmark, so this benchmark for natural language understanding, um, all the top couple results um, are that are now actually surpassing BERT in performance are just taking BERT and training it in a multitask way. Um, I think another interesting uh, motivation for multitask learning is that if you are training BERT, you have a really, really large model. And one way to make more efficient use of that model is training it to do many things at once. Um, another area that's definitely important um, and I think will be important going in the future is dealing with low resource settings. Um, and here I'm using a really broad uh, definition of resources, right? So that could mean compute power. Um, you know, BERT is great, but it also takes huge amounts of compute to run it. So it's not realistic to say um, if you're building, let's say, a mobile, uh, an app for a mobile device that you could run a model the size of BERT. Um, as I already get, went into earlier in this talk, um, you know, low resource languages is an area that I think is pretty um, underrepresented in NLP research right now because most data sets are in English. Um, but I do think right, there's a really you know, large number of people that in order to benefit from NLP technology, um, we'll need to have technologies that work well in a lot of different languages, especially those without much training data. And um, speaking of low amounts of training data, I think in general this is a, an a interesting area of research. Um, within machine learning, actually, people are um, working a lot on this as well. Um, so a term, is often, uh, a term often used is few-shot learning. Um, and that essentially means being able to train a machine learning model that only sees, let's say, five or ten examples. Um, one motivation there is, um, I think, a clear distinction between how our existing machine learning systems learn and how humans learn is that um, humans can generalize very quickly from five or so examples. Um, if you're training a neural net, you normally need you know, thousands of examples or perhaps even tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of examples to get something that works. Um, so I also see this being a pretty important area in the future. Um, the last area where I want to go in um, a little bit more depth is interpreting and understanding models. Um, so, so really, there's two aspects of this. One is, if I have a machine learning model and it makes a prediction, I would like to be able to uh, know why did it make that prediction. So get some rationale, get some explanation. Um, that would especially be important in an area like healthcare, right? So if you're a doctor and you're making a decision, um, it's probably not good enough for your machine learning model to say patient has disease X. You really want it to say patient has disease X for these reasons, um, because then you as a doctor can double check and, and try to validate the, the uh, machine's um, thinking, I guess, um, to come up with that diagnosis. Um, the other area of interpreting understanding models is more of a scientific question, right? Is we know things like BERT work really well. Um, we want to know why do they work well? What, what aspects of language do they model? Um, what things don't they model? Um, and that might lead to um, ideas of improving um, those, those models. Um, so um, here is a, a couple slides on the main approach for answering these sort of scientific questions. What does a machine learning model learn? Um, what you do is you have a model, so let's say it's BERT, it takes as input a sequence of words, um, it produces as output a sequence of vectors. 
Um, we want to ask, does it know, for example, the part of speech of words? So, so it does in its vector representations, does that capture something about syntax? Um, and a simple way of asking this question is train another classifier on top of BERT um, that's trained to do, um, let's say, part of speech tagging. Um, but we only uh, backprop into that diagnostic classifier itself. So in other words, we're treating the output of BERT, um, that sequence of vectors, as a fixed input, and we're sort of probing those vectors to see, um, do they contain um, information about part of speech that this second diagnostic classifier on top um, can decode um, to get the correct labels? Um, so um, there's kind of quite a few concerns here. Um, one concern is uh, if you make your diagnostic classifier too complicated, it can just solve the, classifi the uh, task all on itself, and it can basically ignore uh, whatever representations were produced by BERT. Um, so, so the kind of standard thing right now is to use a single softmax layer on top of BERT um, to do these decisions. Um, and there's been a whole bunch of tasks proposed for evaluating essentially the linguistic knowledge of these models. Um, so you could do part of speech tagging, you could do more semantic tasks like uh, relation extraction um, or, or something like co-reference. Um, and this is a pretty active area of work. Um, here is uh, just one uh, plot showing some of the results um, of this approach. So here what we're doing is we're adding diagnostic classifiers to different layers of BERT, and we are seeing which layers of BERT are more useful for particular tasks. Um, and um, something kind of interesting comes out of this, which is that um, the different layers of BERT seem to be corresponding um, fairly well with notions of uh, different layers of, li of linguistics. Um, so uh, dependency parsing, which is a syntactic task, um, it's a considered sort of a you know, medium level task in understanding a t sentence. Um, the medium layers of BERT, so layers kind of six through eight or something, are the ones best at dependency parsing. Um, if you have a very semantic task like sentiment analysis, um, where you're trying to learn some kind of uh, semantic property of the whole sentence, um, then the very last layers of BERT are the one that seem to encode the most information about, about this uh, phenomenon. Um, okay, so this is almost it for the talk. Um, I just have one slide here of uh, um, NLP not in kind of the academic research context, which I've already been talking a lot about, but NLP in industry, and really there's rapid progress there. And I want to point to two areas where I think there's especially a large interest in using NLP technology. Um, one is dialogue. Um, so for things like chatbots, right, there's the Alexa Prize where they're actually investing a lot of money in um, having groups figure out how to improve chit chat dialogue. Um, there's also, I think, a lot of potential for customer service, right? So improving basically automated systems that'll, um, you know, book you a flight or help you cancel a subscription or anything like that. Um, and similarly, there's a lot of potential in healthcare. Um, one is understanding the records of someone who, um, is sick and, and to help them to help with diagnoses. Um, I think another um, equally important area is actually uh, parsing uh, biomedical papers. Um, so um, the number of biomedical papers that are being written is really insane. Um, it's, it's way larger than the number of computer science papers that are being written. Um, Often, if you are a doctor or if you're a researcher um, in medicine, you might want to look up something very specific, right? You might want to know what is the f effect of this particular drug on this particular gene or a cell with this particular gene. Um, there's no good way right now of searching through um, hundreds of thousands of papers to find if someone has, has uh, done this experiment and have results for this um, particular combination of things. Um, so automated reading of all this biomedical literature um, could have a lot of value. Okay, um, to conclude, um, there's been rapid progress in the last five years due to deep learning um, in NLP. Um, in the last year, we've seen another really kind of uh, a dramatic increase in the capability of our systems thanks to uh, using unlabeled data. So that's methods like BERT. Um, and um, the other kind of thing that's, I think, important to think about is that NLP systems are starting to be at a place where they can have big social impact. Um, so that makes some issues like bias and security very important. Um, thank you. Uh, good luck finishing all your projects. <laughs>